that's what we're doing. I'll just talk to you briefly about choosing your equipment. I know that this is about lighting, so it's kind of important to talk about what kind of equipment you might be thinking about or using right now. Uh, I don't need to tell anybody that we've made a shift to LED primarily as a technology for lighting. There's uh, huge pluses and some minuses, but it's starting to, the Wild West is starting to settle a little bit, and we're starting to get to the point where regardless of the, the fixture you're using and the company you're using it from, we can generally get a pretty good quality of light. Um, where it sort of falls apart is when you start to mix LED fixtures from different manufacturers because they're not all the same. They can all be the same color temperature, but they don't all reflect light that is seen by your cameras exactly the same way. And that's the other part of the problem is that all of these cameras have different sensors. So if you take a, a, an RE sky panel, for instance, uh, that particular panel, uh, 3060, 360, whatever fixture you're using, is really tuned for the Airy Alexa sensor. So it looks great on an Alexa sensor. Does it look horrible with other lights? I mean, other cameras, no, but it's really sort of tuned to that. And then you start using uh, an aperture light with uh, a Kino flow light with uh, a NAN light, and they're not all exactly the same. They don't all use exactly the same LED technology, the same exact engineering formula. So correlated color temperature, you know, the world we live in is primarily in that sort of 2700 warm light Kelvin. You know, we want to get in that Edison-y kind of old school vibe all the way up to about 6500, a cooler sort of daylight is where we sort of live, I would say, for about 95 to 99.9% .9 of the stuff that we do and probably is where we should be and when we're using, you know, lights. And then we have all the fun stuff, you know, uh, which are very useful and, you know, your gags or your effects, cop cars and ambulances and fireworks and paparazzi bulbs and televisions and campfire and all of that crap is useful, but it's useful a very small percentage of the time unless it ties into, for instance, you're producing a television show and you want to have that as sort of a recurring thing. Um, and then, of course, color and being able to use that. And we have sort of two banks of uh, thought right now. Some companies are making lights with both and some are just using one. We have, usually in the sort of mid to high end tier, we have RGB, WW, red, green, blue, and then two types of white, a warm and a, and a, and a cooler white. And those are combined to create color spectrum. And then hopefully when we see that reflected light, it's uh, pretty darn close to seeing our banana and our red pepper and our orange and things like that. And, and hopefully, depending on how you set up your camera, which is also part of it, um, what you're seeing and what you're capturing is, is pretty close to what we're seeing, and then you play in, in post. Um, and then the other technology that we're seeing right now, for instance, in the Nanlux 900C is RGB ACL technology. So that's what you see in the RE Orbiter. You see it in the, uh, the Nanlite uh, 900C, uh, Nanlux, sorry, 900C, uh, ProLights, uh, Kelvin. These are all using RGB ACL. So that's red, ring, blue, amber, cyan, and lime. And there's no actual white LEDs. There's no uh, blue, L it's really when we say white LEDs, I'm talking about sort of daylight tungsten. Uh, and, and the traditional way to handle that when it's not RGB ACL is to put phosphor in front of blue LED light. So you put a, it's, it looks more like a yellowish compound that'll create a daylight bloom of light. It, 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 the blue light hits it, excites the phosphor, it's like fluorescent lights, does the same thing. And then also for, uh, for a warmer color temperature, you'll see a more orange phosphor. And that's sort of what we historically have seen with bicolor lights. So like RGBWW is actual red, actual green, actual blue. And then there's a blue emitter hitting a phosphor for a warm white. There's a blue emitter hitting phosphor for a, a daylight white. And then those combinations. But RGB, ACL, red, green, blue, amber, cyan, yellow, uh, lime, is combining just those emitters in, in those colors and then combining those to create both color and white light. And again, white light to me is sort of that realm where we're thinking about that range. You know, let's say we say 2700 to 6500 Kelvin. Right, there's a question over there. Okay, good, great. 
Um, so right now, I, again, I want to make this fast because I want to get into other stuff. If you're thinking about using um, LEDs, which you really have no choice at this point unless you want to drag out that old Omni and Toda and uh, the Airy 3 light kit, then um, some people got that <laughs> and have used them many times. Uh, you really want to think about you know, what category of LED lighting you want to use. Uh, so we've got some bulbs and we've got tubes. We've got tubes for days now. They're all over the place. Uh, very handy for certain things. I love using four-foot tubes, eight-foot tubes for lighting things like green screens. They're very fast. You take the four-footers from uh, Nanlite, the Pavo tubes, at which they've just updated also, and what you do is you put little grids on them that come with the lights, or I think they, maybe it's an accessory, but you get the idea. Put grids on them, cross-key them, and Bob's your uncle. You know, it's not that hard to light a green screen when you've got a couple of four-foot tubes and you set up one of those panoramic backgrounds from a company like Monfrotto, 13 foot wide, seven foot high, and uh, you just do it. Um, so they're handy for things like that. They're also great for when you're on location. You just, you know, you're shooting B-roll and you need to get around the space really quickly. Uh, tubes are great for that, you know, but you have to be careful because they have a, a strange catch light. It's obviously generally a vertical, strippy catch light in the eyes, and that's not a uh, a natural motivated light, you know, even though we've had fluorescent lights in the world for a long time, except for on movie sets when it's things like Kino Flows, they're usually up in the ceiling. That's where they live. Um, so we're not used to seeing tubes as catch lights in the eye, just like none of us should be seeing things like ring lights as catch lights, but that's a different discussion. Um, so we've got bulbs, we've got tubes, and we've got panel lights, and those start in very small you know, fixtures, very, very handy now. We've got them in uh, RGBW, RGBWW. Uh, Kelvin just released one that's RGB ACL in a panel light, like a little pocket one, you know, that goes in your pocket. There's a lot of great little ones that you can use. And to me, in a lot of ways, that smaller form factor when we're talking about color is a great form factor to have a few things inside of your kit. You just want to do pops of color. You want to replicate something. You're shooting a scene in a, a bar <clears throat> or you're replicating a nightclub or something like that. You know, things, uh, fashion related things where color would come into play and is natural. <clears throat> and I don't know if you've been watching television or movies lately, but there's definitely a trend now that there's a lot of color options in these lights to, to use them, possibly overuse them, possibly use them in ways that look like stuff not so nice. So, um, so those little lights are handy, and then of course we get to our sort of ubiquitous one by one, and we know where that came from, really uh, driven primarily by light panels originally, and then we've seen many of those that have become one by twos, and we see variations of those different lights. Um, and then sort of a subset of those are flexible lights that are kind of in that panel thing, but they have a lot more application in the sense of, uh, how easily they travel and how you can basically uh, rig them or just use them. So, you know, gaff tape up on a ceiling, uh, up against the wall, you know, very lightweight and you can tuck them. We've rolled them sometimes and put them into the eaves of like porches just so we can get a little bit of ambience and things. Um, but those smaller little lights also are very handy for that. And then we start to move into probably the category of lighting that you should be thinking out most times, which is chip on board, so it's a, it reads as a single source, whether it's a bicolor or it's a, 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 you know, a color tunable fixture, RGB, WW, RGB, ACL. Um, you've got a single source, it's got a single shadow, the way it's being cast, and then you can modify that harder light to do pretty much anything. You know, there's only a few companies, one, that, uh, because of their patent and sort of their technology that can take COB and really fine tune it very, very precisely, and that's Dato, um, in my opinion, because they have a two lens system that allows you to create very, very precise light. But we're getting close now. In fact, uh, this light here is the 60B, or the bicolor version from Nanlite. There's also a 60C, so a color version and you can put projectors on these with additional optics and then they have leaves in there and you can actually cut the light very precisely. You can make squares or slashes 
and then there's an insert there for a go bow or a go between. So if you want to project something, you know, the standard noir, you know, Venetian blinds and all of that fun stuff. But there's, you know, trees for days and you can get psychedelic now with all your color and project them everywhere. Again, maybe one or two percent of the time. But great tools, and then you move into larger fixtures where you just have essentially a larger power draw, larger power output, um, which are also chip on board. And then you modify those using, you know, uh, now, thankfully, quite cost-effective modifiers to allow you to use those lights. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, what should I get now if I'm investing in lighting? And for me, there's sort of a few baselines. Yes, you want to have some smaller lights, like 60s, just because they're really handy for kickers, like when you kick a little light on the side of somebody, or you're using it as a backlight, or you're lighting a background and you're using background light. Those smaller fixtures are great because they're relatively spotty, but you can modify them to do other things. They do have projector attachments. They pack very small, and you don't need a huge light for, for creating separation or to create mood in a space generally, because you wouldn't necessarily have those lights at very high output, very high intensity. You know, walk into a well-designed space uh, from a lighting designer in a restaurant or a, a good architectural space, and all of that is subtlety that just creates mood or, you know, feeling in the room. And that's the same way a, a DP or a cinematographer would approach that on a set. They're not going to blast a 500 watt, you know, magenta colored light at a wall unless it was for something very, very specific that was creating a sort of unrealistic mood for people. So, um, so if you're thinking about getting lights that you can use in production in more than just a controlled environment, and I would define this as a pretty controlled environment, as soon as ambient light gets introduced, and, and as soon as the base level of light in the space, whether you're outside or in an interior space where there's a lot of light and available light in the space, that's when you need to have lights that have higher output. You have to balance between things. There's a balance between the ambient light and what you're trying to do in terms of keying, lighting your subject matter, person, object, space, whatever it's going to be. So baseline for me in sort of workhorse things, morning, is probably uh, about a 300 watt light chip on board. Um, you'd probably be better off having a 500 or 600 in your kit just because it's a little bit more versatile and they tend not to be much larger. And the jump in price isn't so great that you're saying, oh, I'm uh, struggling to get the five or 600 over the 300. And what you're getting is something, again, that's gonna travel about the same as the 300, but it's gonna give you the option to have a lot more output. Um, that said, you know, a 300 can do a lot of work on a lot of different Situ in a lot of different situations, um, but having that flexibility is great. And where it really comes in handy, um, and then we'll get to lighting people and faces, is when you're lighting bigger spaces, and you can take a, a light like a, a 500 watt bicolor unit, and you can put a Fresnel lens on there, and you can actually change the beam angle, and you can really concentrate that light. And having that extra output, especially when you're trying to get light from one place to another place can be extremely handy. Uh, and to that end, bicolor, I would be looking for lights right now that are bicolor at minimum, not a single color temperature. We run into a lot of situations where we're dealing with lots of color temperatures, but it's also about creating mood and atmosphere. And we don't take a gel pack out anymore. We're not dropping you know, a CTB or CTO or an amber, like a straw or whatever it's going to be in front of the lights to create mood, that's all coming from the engine of the, of the system. And a lot of these lights now that are bicolor don't just give us a range of about 3,200 to 5,600 Kelvin. We can go to about 27 on the warm side and, you know, 10,000 Kelvin, which is very cool light on the high end. So we have a lot of flexibility actually to play with color, even if it's just correlated color temperature without going into hue and adding your reds and your blues and your yellows and your greens and all of that stuff. So bicolor and also looking for fixtures that have green magenta as an option inside of them. Yes? Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, uh, can I go into the, a little bit deeper in the difference between chip on board as opposed to a panel light? Uh, the biggest advantage to a chip on board is you're starting with hard light, and hard light can always be made softer. But if you take a panel light, you get two downsides with LED technology, depending on how they designed it. Some of them, um, you can see all of the, the LEDs, right, the emitters. So unless you modify it and you use it on talent, you're going to see sometimes the actual cast of those multiple colors, but more than anything, you're going to see multiple shadows. So you have to do something to, to combat that, which is, of course, soften it or put something in there. Um, panel lights, to me, are fantastic fixtures for indoor installations. You think about uh, what we call in news a uh, ring of fire, where they just have lights everywhere, uh, talk shows, you know, sometimes for also soap operas and things like that. You have stuff up in the grid. You need washes of light that are, you know, there. Uh, panel lights are also, and, and two base lights, are better suited for things like lighting green screens and sykes and stuff like that. When we're talking about lighting people and we're talking about lighting, um, you know, things that are objects in, in real world environments, generally we want the flexibility to be able to go between hard and soft light and figure out where that balance is. And, you know, the disadvantage sometimes for some people is that uh, the fixtures get big with the modifiers, but there's ways around that and things that you can do. Yes? So you saw that mod project, it's able to get softer. Yeah. Yep. What, what modifiers do you use on the like Yeah. The question is, what modifier would I use on like a, a, a you know, a, let's say a, we'll just say a larger, but even a smaller. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're bouncing it, yeah. So if you're bouncing into a white card, and I, I prefer bounce light over almost anything else, you know, and, and bounce and diffuse is even better, you know, your concept of a book light. Um, what you need to use as a modifier is not a softbox. You need to keep your light hard, but you need to keep it controllable. So there's two ways you would do that. You would get a projector attachment, which would allow you to adjust the leaves, and you could actually throw that light towards that white card, whether it was right over there where Ben was or it was in the back of the room. Projectors have far reach. So I can actually light a, a relatively large, depending on the fixture, a very large space, and I can have lights that are rigged outside of the space that the actors are. And then you're basically just bouncing that light. And you're basically using either the projector and you're making it fit that card or that place that you're bouncing off of a ceiling. And then the second way would be a Fresnel lens with barn doors where you can basically flag the light around there. I don't know if there's more distance. It depends on the light, and it depends on how they designed it, and it also depends on optics. You know, we've gotten very good optics now in projectors and in and, and, and Fresnel lenses and, that are used with chip on board LEDs, where we're getting close. It's very hard to compare hot lights, quartz halogen lights, <clears throat> to and even HMIs to LEDs because. There's so many variables with modifiers and things like that. But we can talk about that a little bit later. Any other quick questions before we jump into this stuff? OK, let's go. Um, so we did that one. I guess we'll do this one. There we go. Uh, what do I want to do? Well, maybe we'll do this. Here we go. We don't really need to, I mean, let's not even talk about that. It's not a, it was fun, but yeah. Um, so, so when we're, you know, when we're doing things when it comes to, to lighting, um, and, and this, it'll apply to people and, and faces, but it also applies to pretty much anything that you're trying to light. The first thing you're trying to look at is the space that the subject occupies, the person, the object, the area. And, and then, of course, what's the motivation for the light? What kind of mood are we trying to create? You can light an interview and you can have 20 different moods based on how you're lighting it, uh, the intensity or lack thereof of the light that's coming out of the fixture, where that light is positioned. And, and that's part of your job. And, and part of what we do for a living, the creative part, is you know, we, we try to think about the space and the subject or subjects that we're lighting and, and why are we lighting them that way. Well, if it's narrative, 
it's usually pretty easy. Is it a comedy? Is it horror? Is it dark comedy? You know, um, is it thriller? And, and there's certain agreements that we have to a degree that we expect to see things in, in a certain way or there's certain moods that they are there. And if you take cues from those types of things and you, you, you watch movies and television shows, um, you start to see things related to the foreground, if there are foreground elements, and used a lot in production, even sometimes to just break the frame up. And a very simple approach to that is, you know, you've got a camera and it reveals something, because what cinematography is, is it's, it's lighting, it's composition, but what makes cinematography unique is camera movement. So it's the actual movement. What's the camera doing? It's usually revealing or following something. Um, so that's, that's part of your motivation. You know, what am I revealing or what am I following? Um, and then revealing something else sometimes. And so you have to think about that motivation, but it's it, as important that piggybacks onto that, um, which is lighting. So you have to think about foreground, you have to think about what the background is. A lot of uh, DPs and cinematographers will actually first think about lighting their background, and then they'll light their subject matter. Other people will go from front to back, some people will go back to front, because what they want to do is create the mood of the space if they're lighting from the background forward, and they know what they're going to do with the talent. They've already decided, especially in narrative. You know, you have your protagonist, and that protagonist is always shot with a certain style of lighting, sometimes throughout the entire movie or episodic television show. And then they're also shot with certain ratios and a certain mood, and that's sort of consistent. So once that formula is in place to sort of set that, antagonist is shot slightly differently, a little harsher, maybe a little bit differently, but it's a consistency thing then what happens is a lot of people will say, okay, good, so we're in this space now, let's create what the mood of the space is, and then I already know how we're lighting our talents and what we're gonna do for the most part. Um, so you have to think about that. And this is a big one in the corporate world because it's important to talk about how to light people and subject matter, but the light levels, the base inside of a space is so important to how the mood is being created. Oftentimes we'll go in to shoot an interview and you're inside of a hotel room suite because that's gonna give you a couple of looks in terms of I've gotta do six interviews over two days so you rent the large, it's a, cheap, it's a cheap location in actual fact. I want a large hotel room suite that has some visual interest. And then you wind up having to do, I remember we did it in uh, a particular job in Austin. <clears throat> we had to do a daytime interview at nighttime in the hotel room. So what we did is we took a one by one panel. We obviously lit the space and the subject matter, but we also raised the ambient color temperature by just bouncing it off of the ceiling and we lifted the light levels inside of the room so it felt like it was daylight. And then you can cheat it a little bit now, especially with those smaller lights where you can sort of tuck a little light behind maybe the curtain and you just let some of that spill in as daylight and there's little tricks you can do to kind of create that space. But base ambient levels are very, very important. Um, and then your practical lights, whether you're placing them or they're already there, that are your little lamps and, and other things. People are using a lot of those, you know, little panel lights to do stuff like that. And the special is just a light that does a very specific job. So for some reason in the scene, everything just sort of seems, you know, the same, except for your talent. But there's this little light on something in the background out of focus, and then that's going to become something that's going to, or it turns on, or there's a gag, and then you put focus on that particular object. So it's special. It's got its own little job to do something within a scene or what you're doing. Um, and a special might be very simply for us in the corporate world, somebody's doing a, a, a cooking demonstration, but as part of the cooking demonstration, there's a particular knife that they're using, or there's a particular espresso machine that they're using, and for some reason, for very good reason, there's a little special on that. It gets its own little, you know, you're special, and then you put that on to the, the thing. Um, and then we have to sort of think about when we're positioning lights, lateral or horizontal positions, um, and then the height of the light obviously has something to do with it, but because of those positions in relationship to your subject matter, right? So it's always based on your subject matter in relationship to them. We have these different positions. So we talk about central lighting, 
we did usually talk about that from the camera side, right? That's your, your camera lighting. So we can do things like butterfly lighting, clamshell lighting, sort of beauty lighting. You start to move that light, if you're my subject matter, and I start to move that away from camera, and we start to have something called loop lighting, where the light sort of wraps around the face, but we don't get any hardcore shadows, anything that's really objectionable. And as we start to swing that light away from camera, we start to get closer to that 45 degree from where the subject is looking primarily to somewhere 45 to 90 degrees, then the shadows that are cast, depending on the modifiers you're using, start to get a little bit more defined. They become more visible to the user. And then as you start to go around, get split or side lighting, then if you position it exactly correctly, then one side of the face is going to be lit and the other side of the face is going to be completely dark. It's very easy to modify that with fill and things like that. And then we start going back. In the back area in the corporate world is usually reserved for a little kicker light or a backlight. In the narrative world, that back area is sometimes where we're keying from. That's where we're, our main source is coming from. Outside, the sun is behind the person, always behind always looks better, and then you can soften it, and then you can get modifiers in front of and from the camera side to fill that light that's from behind. Because Mother Nature's doing the work, they're putting sun there, you get some big return, and you can just lift that ambient level. Um, make sense? And then there's, of course, background lighting, which is when you're actually lighting or thinking about the background. And then as far as elevated vertical positions, that really just has to do with what degree the light is in terms of height, we all know what that does. If it's underneath, it's looking pretty creepy. If it's right here, it's feeling pretty normal. And then up here, it's pretty cool. We can do some Rembrandt lighting and things like that. And then you start getting far up there, and then we're in Gordon Willis land, and you know, just watch The Godfather. You know what's going on. Um, so <clears throat> when you take those two, the lateral and elevated positions, plus the number, types, and ratio of lights, that helps you achieve lighting setups, looks, and moods. And that's kind of what we're doing. And um, we're going to take a look very briefly. Holy cow, we have no time. We're going to take a look at a couple of things related to that, and then we'll, we'll fire up a couple of lights to just talk about some things. So this is a, a program called Satellite. You'll see it up in the top left. It's made by a German company called Elixir. Um, it's a tool, um, pre-visualization, learning tool. Yes? Set a light. It's up in the top with, with periods, S-E-T, period, A, period, light. Why? I don't know. It's ridiculous, but that's the name of the product. Um, if you're interested in it, let me know. They'll do like a little discount on it, but uh, I'm not pushing this. They didn't, I bought this two, three years ago, and they use it as a tool because um, my kids don't want to be in front of camera and help me, so that's really what happens. So um, it's pretty cool, and what I've done <coughs> here is I built uh, essentially a, a room it's a, just for educational purposes, an 80 foot by 80 foot room. And the lights and modifiers actually work as if they were in the real world. So it's very handy. Um, and they've updated this app considerably. Um, there's, there's quite a few models that you can use and you can tweak those models in terms of what they look like and, and all of that fun stuff. So there's, you know, you can see here, you can pose them and there's different clothes and different ethnic backgrounds and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's a bank of different mono lights, but quite frankly, these will just work as continuous output as well. So if there's a particular modifier that you're looking for and you want to use it, you know, we could go ahead and take, uh, you know, for, we'll just take this for giggles and throw it in here. Um, that's, uh, Lasso Light is now Monfrotto, but they had this big thing called a, a, a highlight, um, and it's just basically a collapsible uh, softbox. So I'll just show it here. Let me go over here and I'll try to get you. It's actually, uh, there, uh, there you go. Still getting used to this room that I built over here. Um, but you'll see, you basically push light inside of it and it becomes a giant softbox. That's what it is. 
Um, I actually have one and they're very handy. Um, I don't think they're necessary for <clears throat> most things. But I've got a camera here, and then what I'll do is I'll, uh, we'll bring in one of our talent here. We've got a uh, good old uh, Aaron here, and then you'll see because that light is bouncing to the background, uh, I'll take the stands away, then we're basically in silhouette. But if I start to turn that light and we start to bring it over here, you'll see it starts to light our talent, right? So we can go in and we can set a lot of different lighting setups in here. And what I did uh, for myself, which you could do as well, it just takes time to do it, is I set up uh, a few different people. Here, I'll just turn on a, uh, just a zero degree light so you can see it. And I set up um, each of our talent over here with uh, a few different poses. So basically looking to camera, looking camera right, looking camera left, and then just a moody, you know, my, my partner's mad at me. My spouse is pissed off, you know, whatever. Um, and then I did the same thing for people who uh, just different ethnic backgrounds, different ages. So we've got uh, a few different people here that can be used to turn on and off. And then as I start to turn on and off these lights, for instance, I, uh, let's, bring, let's bring Aaron back. And um, I figure because we're moving towards AI, we might as well, you know, start to give people things, names, and you never, now I'm just messing around. Um, so there's Aaron, and now I turned on the, uh, the, basically the 22 and a half degree thereabouts. Here's a 45 degree light, and then you can see what happens when you start to turn it up. And, and you can go into the room, and you can start to look at those lighting setups and sort of where they are, and then you can select things and uh, move things around, and you get the basic idea in terms of what you can do. So I turned that off, and I've got a Rembrandt light here, so I can start to bring that up. And um, <clears throat> we can take a look at where that Rembrandt light is. And then we can say, oh, that's a, that's a light. Let me select it. This happens to be an equivalent of a, a, an aperture 300x, right? So it'd be the same thing as the 300B2 uh, over here. It's a chip on board 300 watt light. So right now I have it, at, based on how far away it is from talent, I have it at about 5 or 6%, which is, which is about right in terms of what's happening. And then I can go in here and based on all of these helper tools here that exist, um, you can go in and there's all of these different props. I can go in and uh, modify or change the lights that I'm using, so on and so forth. And they just keep adding to this. So it becomes quite a useful tool. If you haven't noticed already, if I go up to the camera and I select it, you can see that they have photo and they have film cameras. And then up here I can choose sensor size I can choose aspect ratio. I can choose both zoom and prime lenses at different focal lengths. I can go ahead and choose, is this a normal spherical lens or is it anamorphic? Uh, and it will, in part of its equation, in terms of light loss and everything else, it'll factor in frame rates. So you can actually put your frame rates in there, your shutter. Um, it'll do it in degrees when you're using a film camera. And then your shutter switches over to shutter speed when you're using a photo camera. So um, pretty handy stuff. And, and then you can also, of course, change your ISO and your color temperature. I shouldn't say, of course. And then your T or your f-stop. So it's factoring all of those maths into the equations of what happens when you set up these lights and these modifiers. And it becomes, in my opinion, one of the easiest, most useful tools to be able to work out your lighting for a particular project. And what's great about it is you can create your space to be as large or small as you want it to be. So you can say, I'm going to create something that's like 1,000 feet by 1,000 feet. And you can throw a modifier up there and throw light and see what happens. Um, you know, it's a little tricky for the exterior stuff because it's not really designed for that yet. I'm hoping to have some conversations with them about that because that's sort of the holy grail. Um, Cine Tracer, which is a, a game that you can get on Steam from Matt Workman, is sort of this ever-evolving uh, application or game that is sort of like that. But the problem is it's sort of perpetually in beta or alpha. And he gets distracted and he starts building things and other things, uh, rightfully so. Yes? Oh, yeah, in Cinema 4D? Oh, he did, yes. He started there. Yes, exactly. He still sells that. And now he's building stuff in basically the 
Unreal Engine, uh, the newer version, but for uh, Fortnite, like the Unreal Engine, Fortnite thing. So he's building a whole thing there. So we'll see where he winds up. But what's great about his solutions is he does think about exterior spaces. And he does think about big. So you're walking into a, a city, you know, like Times Square or something like that. And how do I deal with that? So it can be very useful. But for interior, for sure, this is a, an extremely useful tool. And it, you know, it lets you do some things that you might not normally do when you're thinking about that. So for Rembrandt lighting, simply, you know, what we might wind up doing is going in here and actually having some sort of modifier there. So for instance, uh, on the camera right side, I could go ahead and put in uh, basically a frame. And then I can actually choose that frame right here, and I can decide what size it's going to be. So I created a 4 by 4 in this case. I can make it an 8 by 8 And then you'll see that we saw that there's some light levels dropping here. But then I can go back up here to my main fixture, which is my Rembrandt right. And I can go ahead and I can increase the intensity of that. But of course, because we now have a modifier, that light is softened and it's starting to change. Um, so having the ability to have a playground like that is great. Uh, now, what's interesting is, especially with something like Rembrandt lighting, when you start to bring different people in who are of different ethnic background and also with different shaped faces, the way the light falls on different people with this particular style of lighting is uh, all over the place. So well, let's say bye to Aaron for a second and bring up Ricardo, and you'll sort of see that standard Rembrandt triangle that we're seeing here with Aaron, which is that opposite side. Um, this, is, this is what we call short side lighting, right? So we're shooting on the short side. We're looking into the short side. Um, if we flip the key, which I can do very simply in here, and we'll just kind of take a look at it, uh, that would be called broad side lighting. Um, so basically not shooting into the shadow. So I'll turn off that Rembrandt right, and I should have somewhere in here a Rembrandt left. And you'll see that now the camera is looking into that key side, and this is broad side lighting. And it's OK. In fact, it's one of the one ways you can very easily solve reflections in glasses with this style of lighting for people. You can flip your key, and you can go broad instead of short. And it helps solve the problem with the reflections. There's other ways we can handle that. But, but it's not always raising the light, because then you lose the catch light, especially with the shape of certain people's eyes. I mean, people who have very deep sockets, and there's plenty of people out there who have very deep eye sockets, as soon as you start to raise that light to places where somebody who's maybe Asian doesn't have that more round, flatter face, you could raise that light for days. And it's like, I still got a catch light. And then you've got somebody else who's like Eastern European, they've got dark, you know, deep sockets in their eyes. And then all of a sudden, it's like the light's here, and you don't see any catch. They're in the dark. It's almost like you're top lighting them. So Rembrandt lighting is beautiful. It's not my recommended style of lighting when you're shooting 10, 15, 20 interviews over a two, three day period of time. Because what you're going to do is you're going to be constantly moving those lights. So we'll, we'll flip back to our short side lighting over here. And we'll take a look at that. And if there's a question, feel free to ask it right now. I'm happy to while I just turn some stunt on and off. It does. It has specific lights from, it has like airy lights and it has uh, some aperture lights and it has some lights from Lumiere, you know, DMX lights. And they keep adding to them. So, you know, they could add a, a 900C at some point. They could do a 500B2. Um, I personally think they should have made it a little bit more generic. But if they are actually taking the engine of that light and actually taking it into the equation, not all 500 watt COB LEDs have the same output. They might be drawing a similar amount, but the way they're driving those LEDs might be different. Uh, Kino Flow is a perfect example. When they switched from tubes to LED, they basically regulated their output for gaffers so that if you took the equivalent of a diva light, two foot diva light, and now you use that as a, a, a two foot LED light, they tuned it so that the output originally, they're not doing it really now, was about the same. Because a gaffer could take that light, set that light, and then they could strike it, and at full output, it would be similar to a diva light. Um, yes? 
It's not camera specific ISO, and that's a moving target, let's be honest. I mean, you know, it's like, I remember when Fuji used to, like 800 was like 1600 on, a, on another camera, or vice versa, actually. 1600 on a, on a Fuji originally was like 800, so it was a full stop difference, or close, two thirds maybe. So it's close, it's not gonna be perfect, but the world is close and not perfect. So we're gonna go with it, yes. It will bounce off of everything, absolutely, 100%. Yep, you can create a ceiling, yep. You can do all that stuff, yes. And it will, it will bounce off and reflect and do all that stuff, 100%. Good, this is not about set of light, of course, yes. Is there the ability to put in scenic elements in the program yet? There are, um, there's a, a prop space one, so for instance right here I've, uh, I threw in a drum kit and uh, I've got a, a microphone stand just for now, but there's over here, there's props, and you can, the new version, uh, I know that certain 3D formats will be supported, so you can import some 3D objects, but you know, as a starting point, it's, it's got some stuff inside of here. Um, so, you know, I've got the drums in that, and what I did in the background is uh, I basically said, oh, let me, uh, let me have a little special on that stuff. So what I did, come on, kid. Or camera left background light. So you'll see a light um, pops up over here, and that light is that light right there. And then I can go ahead and change that light, and I'm basically refocusing it. Uh, that's hitting that back psych wall right now. And, uh, and you just mess with it. There's a lot of controls, but uh, again, this is not about set of light, but uh, it's important to look at the fact that, you know, you look at Rembrandt lighting with Ella and May compared to Aaron, and that's because of the shape of their face and the way the light's falling. So if I wanted to Rembrandt May over here, I know I'm gonna have to take that key light over here and, oh, that's weird looking. That's when AI goes wrong. Um, and then you basically would move that away from camera more, and as I'm moving it away from camera, we're starting to see that triangle, right? You need a toolbox to play in, you know? And uh, this is a good toolbox because it helps you. Yes? Well, it, it might be a little bit of a different answer for me of when I would and wouldn't use it. Um, I use it as sort of like a, you know, it's like you go to the gym, which I clearly don't, um, but this is like the, the exercising your muscles thing. And we get into ruts in terms of what we do lighting wise. You know, I'm a, a a, a complete disbeliever. If you want to join my cult of no three-point lighting, then please join me. Um, because three-point lighting is basically, it's, it, it's defining what should be happening when you are lighting subject matter. But it doesn't mean that you should be setting up three lights. It just means that each one of those three main lights is doing a job. One is your, your main source of light, your key, one is filling in shadows, and then the other one is generally creating separation. Well, very oftentimes, A, you don't need a, a, an actual light to modify, um, you know, fill. You can just use a, a bounce or a card. But oftentimes, the space itself or how you light your key will have a lot to do with whether or not you're creating separation. And you don't necessarily need to add a light or set up a light to create separation. Oftentimes, the spaces that you're in well chosen or just by happy accident will create that separation for your subject matter. Yes? So in, cinema, in a lot of cinematic productions, they have like really dark buildings, dark light. Yes. How they Yeah, so in very dark light situations, um, what they might do is in order to have a catch light, so there's something there and there's some exposure on the face, um, they'll have a small light or smallish light that's sort of hanging out in the camera area. So that might be anywhere from sort of, from where subject matter is looking, you know, we'll call that zero degrees, somewhere between there and about sort of 30, 35 degrees. You wanna make sure that it's catching in the eye. It, most of the time, if your motivation of light is coming from one side or another side, you don't necessarily want your catch light to be right where the camera is because it doesn't feel motivated, because in the eye, and this is the biggest thing I will tell you about lighting people in faces,
go to shotdeck.com, you know, pull scenes from movies and television shows, and stop on the frames of things that you like. And the first place you want to look is in the eyes, because it will tell you so much about where that light is coming from. It'll tell you the shape of the modifier or the main light that's there. Is it square? Is it, uh, you know, is it octagon shaped? Is it round? Whatever it's going to be. And it will also tell you, if you look in the eyes, is it higher up or is it lower or is it sort of in the middle? And it's a, it's a huge advantage to be able to do that. Um, finish, say that question again. <laughs> I usually keep track. What was it? Oh yeah, dark. So, so your motivation for your for your catch light, if you're going to set one, and it's not just doing that job naturally, <clears throat> is to keep it on the side of where your your light is coming from, and as close to where that motivated light is, but still getting it into the eyes. Because if you keep it just sitting right below your lens, it'll look like somebody just set a little light, and it, it could be something like this, but at like one percent, and you just sort of sneak it from the same side color temperature wise so you can get a little something in the eyes so that they're not dead. Because that's, it's great for certain things, for certain characters, for certain mood. But about 99.9% .9 of the time, you want to catch light. And you know, the rule is, if there's only one thing in focus in the scene, and there's people there, it's going to be the eyes. You know, nothing worse than having soft focus on the eyes. Um, so does that make sense to everybody overall? Okay, good. So. From that standpoint, you know, if I now take this Rembrandt light and we 86 that for a second, um, now that I'm lighting that background, you can see that we've, we've got a silhouette. I mean, that's how you create silhouettes. You know, you basically push the light away from the person. But if I wanted to, I could turn on one of these, you know, lights that are, this one is closer on the other side. But if I start to go towards the back of where we are, let's say we turn on the 180 light and we start to bring that up. You'll see, whoa, I have two people again. I'm doing this creepy. I don't know. Oh, oh, there we go. So the light is pretty bright over there, and I would probably lower it, but that light is right behind, um, you know, talent right now. And then um, I'll turn that off, and we can take a look at a couple of other light positions. So you can see there's one. This would just sort of be a little bit of a kicker. Um, if I did that from the other side, um, then you would see, where is that? 225, 135. There we go, boom. That's coming from the other side. So that would kind of be uh, a kick as well, depending on how you lit the person. And, and that's creating mood and atmosphere a little bit. We don't really have much of a catch light, but we can go ahead and change the focal length here and take a look at it and see if we're seeing much there. And then, you know, what I love about this tool is I can just take that camera uh, that I had set up here, unlock it, and then I can start to look up a little bit more and see what's there. So we're, we're maybe not quite where we need to be with that catch light, so we would bring something else in there. Um, but you get the basic idea, right? So you get, use this as a tool to start mapping out um, the styles of lighting that, that A, you're drawn to, but also trying things that you don't normally do. Playing with modifiers like a Fresnel lens or a reflector or a larger softbox and starting to work with frames and uh, beadboard like for bouncing light and, and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's a great tool um, and it can help you sort out things. I'm going to start to do more educational content using this. So that's kind of the stuff that will be on the Teachable site. It's going to be like 15 to 30 minute lessons that are inexpensive, you know, no more than probably 10 bucks um, so that you can see certain things and learn certain things about Lighting, yes. Do you ever use this for storyboarding? I don't use it for storyboarding, no. No, we'll usually, you know, kind of take a look at the script or what the outline of the project is and, and we'll talk out, like if I'm the DP or if I'm hiring, because oftentimes I produce direct and I don't DP, but I have a very specific idea of where I want to go with the lighting. So we'll talk all of that stuff out. But you could absolutely do it. I mean, if you're conceptualizing something like a cooking show or you're doing something that's, you know, a scene or something like that, you could absolutely use this. Um, it doesn't really have any animation uh, capabilities, so I don't know what they're going to do with, you know, version 3 uh, when it comes out. But, you know, you can definitely build out um, different things here. So you'll see 
This is uh, like a little set here that's sort of got a kitchen and so on and so forth. And you can start to mess with, you know, turning on and off gobos and your modifiers and what you're, you know, what you're doing here. So um, it does allow you to do quite a few things. Um, I think I might have maybe one other one here that I can show you. Um, but simple, you know, just sort of like, this is a really simple one with somebody where, you know, the setup is uh, a light that's in the soft box, which is sort of already breaking the light and diffusing it. And then it's going through a much bigger modifier that I created, which is an eight by eight. Um, and then, you know, just a small light here is sort of a kicker light on the, uh, on the right side, you know, camera left side of town. Um, make sense? Good. So just want to talk about and strike a couple of lights here and talk about maybe a couple of things that have to do with uh, one particular lighting setup that I think could be handy, especially when you're working in smaller spaces and you're working with people and that Rembrandt sort of loop lighting closer to the camera can be problematic because you're always feeling like there's too much light going onto the background. And controlling that means when you're in a small crew environment, oh, okay, I gotta go get a C stand, I've got to set up a floppy cutter, you know, four by four that you open up and it creates negative fill or it blocks light. And that's a whole nother step. So, and if you want to create nice big ambient light, then you can absolutely do that with, uh, with that style of lighting. But the advantage of, um, you know, the advantage of larger modifiers like this, this is, uh, you know, essentially like a 60 uh, or thereabouts, 150 centimeter modifier is it's big, it's very soft. Um, you can do a lot with it in terms of lighting people and also uh, objects. This is great for tabletop. In fact, when we did our workshops, uh, my friend Caleb Pike did a whole lesson where he just took a table and put this up against the table on an angle and you've got just a huge soft box area there. And then you can add little specials and, and other lights to it. So it becomes great for that kind of stuff. We can also, which we might do in a second, add a grid to that. And the grid is obviously going to suck up some of that light, but it's going to concentrate it so it's not really spilling over here. It's really coming out in this direction. So 48-inch uh, ones are fine, but when we're talking about really making something that's soft that wraps around people, I think something along these lines is uh, a good decision in terms of what you would do. Um, I think we should just get somebody into a chair, and I don't know if this camera is going to reach, so we might have to go in this direction, which kind of sucks. But you know, what are you going to do? That's life. Um, thank you, Ben. Can everybody sort of still see over there? I hope. I try. You know what they say: we scare because we care. So. The best animated films ever. You might not agree with me, but I'm going to go with it. Um, that camera up here. And you can ask a question while I'm doing this. No problem, oh. Anybody? Uh, camera I'm using right now is uh, XH2S from Fuji. This camera could be uh, an FX30. It could be a C hundred C. Uh, could be a five D Mark II. I don't really care. I mean, I do. I want ten bit. I want four two two. I want information being captured. Uh, but the reality is, it doesn't really matter. Let's be honest. Be honest with ourselves, gearheads. We love all the good stuff, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so anybody want to uh, just? Not that you do, but it might be you, Ben. We'll see sitting in the chair, uh, and we'll strike that. We'll keep it tux, uh, tungsten for now, and uh, we'll see what happens. I think I can switch over to a camera. Oy. We need a couple more hours, everybody. There we go. I'm not filming anything, so if you're on camera, it's not me. I'm not taking any responsibility for that. Um, so this soft box does not have a baffle because once you start to get to higher output LEDs, a, a very uh, 
common thought process by a lot of people is LEDs are cool lights. They produce enormous amounts of heat. It's just heat management that's different than when you use a hot light. So great for talent, things like that. But we have to have giant heat sinks or fan systems in order to cool those. Um, so the baffle can get dangerous at higher color temperatures. But we do have a modifier in the front that's very unspotty, which is a, a equivalent to a magic cloth. So it's a pretty heavy diffusion. Uh, so when it's hitting the sides of that soft box and then it's coming out, it's blooming the light in it a nice way. So uh, let's just, I don't know, get somebody on camera. Maybe we get, you want to get the 6dB and take off the uh, modifier and we can you know, rake some light. Anybody want to sit down? Come on. Let's go, kids. I don't have time for this. We're closing up shop in a minute. Um, get these. I like these Flotec legs. I'm a Miller person myself, but I do love these legs. I might put my Miller head on these Flotex because they're so fast to, uh, to, to fix here. So we're kind of looking at a, sort of a split lighting, right? So it's a side key. Um, and let me just, because I, I have this same disease that most of you have, which uh, I don't know if we can say OCD anymore, but I have it. So, and we're looking straight to camera. And this is just sort of split lighting, right? So we're going split. But the beauty of this is when we're using split lighting, it's very forgiving to a lot of different people, especially when you're using a big source. There we go, I brain farted there for a second. Okay, so we've got a big modifier over here. And then this is just a, um, this is just a little nano light stand. You got the uh, mini grip head from uh, Matthews, mini Mathalini clamp, little clamp. And then this is the uh, Halo. Uh, this packs down to nothing, but I really like using these for fill because that little mini grip head and stuff, I can just place this wherever I want. So if you're buying reflectors, buy them with handles now. Life is easier when you do that. And if we start to bring that in and you're looking to camera, we can start to fill this in. And if we're looking for moody, we can absolutely do it with this. Um, I don't have the little panel light, I don't think, but I could probably use this just for now. So this is the little 60, um, the whole unit. Yeah, I got it. So just pretend that this is a, pretend that this light that I'm about to use, dang, that's loud, is a, um, and that this modifier is a little larger. Like if, if I have my choice, I try to match my key and my fill to about the same size. So if I'm using a four by on this side, I'll probably use a four by over here. Um, you can create like a little light sandwich over here. But sometimes what you'll find is you'll find that the output of this light and you want to keep it low and you really like it is, uh, let me just drop this in intensity. Sorry, everybody. Doop do CCT loop. What the hell is that? What's going on with this thing? Here we go. Bingo. So, um, are we 3200 on that? Yeah. So one of the tricks that you can do is instead of actually setting a light as uh, a fill light, bounce your light off of whatever your fill is over here. And you might have to position it differently. You notice, whoa, if you use a, yeah, exactly. You'll see over here, if I start to increase the intensity of that light, I can dial it up or down and it's coming off of a, a much larger source. So, you know, I can put this at 1% here, and that looks like dog poo, right? And then you go over here, and it's sort of, you can dial this up or down. And it's great because it's really fast. So somebody sits down and they have darker skin tone, you just want to lift that fill a little bit. Sometimes what I'll do is a one light solution, where I basically just have a four by four frame, and coming off of it, is a little tiny panel light. Like Nanlite makes one called the 5C. All of the other companies have them. And you just dial that intensity up or down. And it's really easy. Obviously, you can use an app or a little remote or something like that. And it makes it very simple. And then you start to dial this up and down. And what's great about this style of lighting is, is that me? No, good. Um, is this style of lighting is, really nice for anybody. So once you get it dialed in, it doesn't matter what the shape of the person's face is, it's really nice lighting for any type of 
face. So you can like bang out things. Plus, split lighting is, well, think about what you want. It's a little sourcey right now. Can we bring that down just uh, about 10, I don't know, a few percent on that? Um, but split, split lighting is really what we see in narrative work almost all of the time. Uh, we're going to do one other little quick setup for everybody that's very fast. We're just going to basically uh, take these two little nano stands here. And I'm just going to take another modifier and show it to you, just so you can kind of take a look at this. Again, I wish we had more time, because we could delve into this a lot more. Sorry. I'm going to strike it, and you could unplug that. Uh, I'm going to bring up house lights for a second. We're going to make it, kids. It's going to happen. Uh, this is just a six by six, and I travel with this all of the time. So it's a six foot by six foot. It's uh, called half grid cloth. It's not a half a stop. It's less light than that. And uh, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to do something similar. Let's bring that stand over here if that's cool, Ben. And just because it's good enough for television, I'll give you that. I'm going to do this. Okay, and we're just going to hang it, but usually we do this off of a C stand and you can clamp it and all that fun stuff. I'm just going to raise this up. Another little tip with light stands, never go all the way to the end. Always go up to the top and then back it off a little bit. So, will help. Um, I'll take this. That's, is that as high as it go? What's going on? Uh, this will go up a little. Well, it's not going to help us. All right, good enough. I'll take it. Let's bring it in and back to me a little. Woof. All right, that'll do. All right. And we'll take this little sucker. We'll take off the reflector because that's intensifying the light and making the beam angle uh, more. And then we'll get this dialed up. And then let's go ahead and uh, number four, sir, on that panel on the other side of the speaker. That top, bottom, yeah, boom. All right. So what we can do is we can start to dial that up. And we can start, but look, look over, what is your name, sir? Juan. Look at Juan's uh, shoulder, and you'll see that there's already separation that's happening here because we're using a larger modifier, right? So we can create some separation there, and of course we can fill it and this and that. But it's all scalability. You know, when you're going into a space, the, the way you light, um, is motivated by the style or the mood of what you're trying to do. When you go from a small, uncontrolled space to a larger, uncontrolled space, um, your fixtures and their output and the modification of those fixtures just scales. And then you also have to think about the ambient or the base level. So you're going out and you're shooting outside. Is there a lot of light or is it nighttime and there's very little light? but you still have to treat it the same way as walking into an interior space. And how much am I going to need? It's insane. A 500B2 right now at 1% or 2% in the controlled environment is plenty of light coming out of it for a key. But then when you go outside or into a lot of ambient light, you get a lot more flexibility.